I direct the California Office of Poets and Writers, and um, I'm glad you're all here today. After hearing um, Kevin's really useful talk about pretty much everything related to publishing, we're going to now shift gears and talk about um, everything but publishing, which actually I find strangely liberating. Um, you know, I think that it's there is an understandable emphasis on publishing um, when it comes to writing, but it's really just one part of writing um, and one part of another part uh, as all of the people who gave us feedback in the focus groups that Melissa mentioned earlier um, said, you know, another, another big part is um, finding a literary community, people who can give you feedback on your work, people um, who are interested in the same things that you are, and um, ways to share your work that go beyond just submitting, getting rejected, submitting, getting rejected, submitting, getting accepted. Um, so um, I've invited uh, four people who I think are particularly knowledgeable about um, resources for writers in the Los Angeles area. And um, I'm going to briefly introduce them and then let them talk in a little bit more depth about what they do. Then I'm going to ask them a few questions and then you can ask them questions. And in case I forget to ferment in case I forget to mention it later, there's going to be um, a coffee break after this. Um, yay! Yay, <laughs> yay coffee. <laughs> um, I'll start at the end of the table. Terry Wolverton um, is a literary artist, author of 10 books, most recently Wounded World, lyric essays about our spiritual disquiet, and editor of 14 literary collections. She's the founder of Writers at Work, a creative writing studio in Los Angeles, and an affiliate faculty member in the MFA writing program at Antioch University. She's also a co-founder of the Future of Publishing Think Tank. And she has received fellowships from the California Arts Council and the City of Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department. Next to her is Rick Lupert, who's a two-time Pushcart Prize-nominated poet who's been involved in the Los Angeles poetry community since 1990, serving for two years as a co-director of the Valley Contemporary Poets and hosting the long-running Cobalt Cafe reading series. His poetry has appeared in numerous magazines and literary journals, including the Los Angeles Times, Rattle, I'm not sure if Chiron Review, how do we say that? Chiron Review. Chiron Review. Um, I tried to make it sound like my name, which was a sosh. <laughs> Um, Red Fez, Zuzu's Petals, Stirring, The Bicycle Review, Caffeine Magazine, and Blue Satellite. He's edited several anthologies and, offered, and authored 15 poetry collections, including Brendan Constantine is My Kind of Town, <laughs> From Inevitable Press, and Up Liberty's Skirt from Castle, Castleberry Press. And Rick created and maintains PoetrySuperHighway.com, an online resource and publication for poets, which I definitely would encourage you to check out. Next to him is Lauren Humphrey, who, armed with a BA in creative writing from the University of Southern California, went on to write for blogs, create an award-winning PSA for the ACLU, and set her roots down in Los Angeles. After working for an attorney, an attorney, an attorney. <laughs> so essentially it's thing. just felt like an eternity. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about attorneys. Don't sue me. And writing movie-based lesson plans, Lauren changed gears and started an internship at 826 LA. She's now the AmeriCorps VISTA Volunteer Outreach and Support Assistant in Mar Vista. And Tracy Kato Kiriyama is, an, is a writer, actor, multidisciplinary performing artist, and educator. She's the director of the nonprofit Tuesday Night Project, an organizer for the Generations of War Peace Education Project, and one half of the Pull Project Ensemble, whose current touring show is Pull, Tales of Obsession. Her second book of poetry is forthcoming from Writ Large Press in 2014. So thank you guys all for being here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so if you'd like to just go down the line and share a little bit more about what you do and what your relationship 
to the literary community is, um, please do. We'll start with Tracy, we'll start on this end. Okay. Hello everybody, how's it going? Uh, I'm with a project called Tuesday Night Project and I work with a bunch of different artists and activists and educators out in Little Tokyo. And um, who's, just show of hands, who's been out to Little Tokyo, who's really familiar with it? Some people <coughs> live there. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, when we started our space back in 1998 with our official first program in February of 1999, um, if I had asked that question, there'd be like two <coughs> people that would maybe kind of know Little Tokyo. And at that time, it was pretty dead. And we would walk around that neighborhood and, um, uh, you know, it was common in the community for people to say, man, J-Town's dying, J-Town's dying. There's, you know, one, there's three left in the country. This one's going to go next. Mm -hmm. And we were actually really inspired by a lot of events happening in Highland Park and in Boyle Heights and the east side, as well as South LA from other communities. And uh, namely the Chicano Latino community, I have to say, especially. Uh, we always felt like things were just going on every single week. Things were multidisciplinary. People were talking about their communities. People were talking about their issues, and they were doing it through art. And in that process, they were bringing people together just really naturally. So our friends were like, hey, what's going on with the API scene? What's going on with the API scene, the Asian Pacific Islander community? And so our attempt at creating this space called the Tuesday Night Cafe was our way of trying to bring people together based upon this understanding of a need. And I've always thought that that was the best way to kind of go about programming based upon need and actually surveying folks, seeing what kinds of needs there were in the community to come together and, and create art together and create space together. So we've been going ever since. We just finished our 15th year. So we're one of the longest running spaces in downtown now and it's free. It's multidisciplinary, so it's not poetry writing only, but we have all kinds of folks uh, who come and tell stories who come and uh, share poetry and music and all kinds of things. So, yeah, that's... Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> my name is Lauren Humphrey, and uh, I have a really long title that takes up four lines on my business card. But what I uh, abbreviate it to is I'm the volunteer coordinator at 826LA uh, in Mar Vista. Has anyone heard of 826LA? That is the most amount of hands that has ever been raised when I've asked that question, and that's thrilling. Um, for the, those of you who did not raise your hand, I'm not judging. Uh, I'm enlightening you and saying uh, we're a nonprofit writing and tutoring center. Um, we are just down the road. We were in the Spark Building for seven years and uh, moved last year uh, just down the road a little bit to Mar Vista. Uh, we're right at Venice and Sentinella. We have a second location in Echo Park, and we just opened a third satellite center in uh, Manual Arts High School, which is in South LA. Uh, and what we do is we provide completely free uh, tutoring programs and creative writing programs for 8,000 kids in LA every year, um, which is a lot of people. And the way we do it is through um, pairing up folks like yourself to come and work with these kids, ages six to 18. Um, and what that looks like on the ground, because that's like a really great idea, but what it comes down to, what it is in reality is, um, we give uh, free after school and evening tutoring. We go into high schools and middle schools and support teachers curriculum. Uh, we have book writing field trips come into our space in the mornings. And then we also have free uh, weekend and evening writing workshops for kids. Uh, the workshops in particular are pretty neat um, because they're developed and led by volunteers. So you get to spend a couple hours teaching kids um, about writing in a, in a way that's creative and fun and unique and can run the range from uh, writing pizza recipes or comic book characters or um, one workshop that was always really, I thought it was always really neat. We haven't done it in a while, but it was writing for pets and um, it was... Uh, especially for kids who were really hesitant to write or share their writing. And um, volunteers would, would uh, sit with the kids and write a letter to a pet. And the volunteers would bring a pet. And we've had goldfish and iguanas mm -hmm. and um, dogs and sometimes cats, which like scare me a little bit if I had to like face a cat and read to it. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, but... <laughs> They would write a letter to that animal and then they would read it and um, there's a guarantee that the animal's not going to laugh at them or tell them that it's stupid or make fun of them for what they wrote and they'll usually just like be into looking at you. 
and, uh, <laughs> and maybe lick you. And so it was, uh, it's a way of um, getting our students who are primarily under-resourced and underserved students in LA um, to fall in love with riding and to show them how important it is um, to be able to ride effectively and write well. And that's what we do. Thank you. Rick. Hi, uh, Rick Lupert. I just saw a picture of a book online at uh, Skylight Books that was called How to Talk to Your Cat About Gun Control. <laughs> so, um, I think there might be some I don't want to talk to cats. <laughs> that we can do here. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to Cheryl and poets and writers for asking me to participate in this, for, for thinking that I had anything interesting to say. I was pretty sure after the invitation that um, I would come to this panel, and as a result of my participation, we would all end up actually knowing less than when we started. <laughs> um, but I'll endeavor. Um, I, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, I have hosted a reading at the Cobalt Cafe in Canoga Park, an open mic poetry reading since 1994, about 20 years now. Um, it features a generous seven minute time limit, which uh, allows people who participate in the open mic to kind of put together a little mini featured set, um, as well as makes for some, some very long evenings. Um, <laughs> in addition to the uh, open mic portion, there's a featured reader who comes every week. A couple of the weeks out of the month, I pick and present who that is, and a couple of the other weeks, I invite other groups to pick and present, including the Valley Contemporary Poets, which is a San Fernando Valley-based uh, literary organization that has existed since 1980, as well as the Hollywood Institute of Poetics, which is loosely an organization. It's a bunch of other people who've kind of banded together to present readings all over LA. And the idea behind asking other people to uh, pick and present the featured poets beyond myself is to increase the sensibility of who is presented at the reading to the audience beyond my own, which I think is a, a good thing. Um, I also run this website called Poetry Superhighway. That's been up since 1997. I publish two poets every week chosen from uh, online submissions. I, uh, we do all kinds of interesting projects. We have a contest every year, uh, which is a, a kind of an equal opportunity contest. Um, in addition to having the possibility of winning the contest and, and the cash prize, um, many people, uh, other literary organizations and individuals donate prizes to the contest. So every single year that we've done the contest, every person who's entered has received a prize just for entering, a poetry book, uh, a subscription to something or other, that kind of thing. It's cool. We do other projects like that. The, every year we do something called the Great Poetry Exchange, where if you have a book of some kind, it could be a uh, a legitimately published book. It could be something that, uh, uh, not that any other form, I shouldn't have said legitimately, it could have been a, it, a book published in any form, a chat book, anything of that nature, um, uh, and, and you're willing to donate it. Um, I, I collect uh, uh, participants throughout the month of February, I think it is, and at the end of February, I will in turn send you an email to say, okay, you send your book to this person in another part of the world, and uh, then someone else is gonna send you a book. So we do all kinds of things like that. Uh, we publish, uh, during National Poetry Month, we publish a, a writing prompt every day uh, during the month, which are submitted by other participants in Poetry Superhighway. Uh, Poetrysuperhighway.com, check it out. Thank you. Terry. Uh, so I wanted to just start by um, saying something briefly about where I come from which is um, I moved to Los Angeles in the early 1970s to participate in the Women's Building, which was a feminist arts organization. And one of the really great things that I learned at the Women's Building is that creativity flourishes in community. We sometimes, there's kind of a destructive myth about the lone solitary genius who goes up and does it all, you know, usually by himself, um, but sometimes by herself. And I think that idea that we have to do it alone or that we're supposed to do it alone doesn't really work for most of us. And so a lot of the work that I've done since 
um, having that opportunity to be at the Woman's Building has been about trying to foster situations where writers can find support. And support takes a lot of different forms. Uh, I mean, I have an organization, Writers at Work. Uh, I have some flyers. I'll talk about it maybe a little bit later. But some of the forms of support that I've seen work are um, having an art buddy, having somebody to check in with that you, about whether you're working or not. And you know, it might sound like, oh, what's the big deal? But I'll tell you, the idea that there's somebody else on the planet who gives a shit whether I wrote today or not <laughs> is so powerful for me. Um, and I've had art buddy relationships where we've checked in daily. I've had art buddy relationships where we've checked in a couple times a week. It doesn't even have to be another writer. It could be another, uh, you know, an artist in another medium. But somebody who's there and kind of rooting for you, or, um, you know, when we hit rough spots, as we all inevitably do, somebody who can be a sounding board for that and be encouraging to keep going. Another thing that I've seen work really well are writing dates. And that's where you get together with another writer or multiple writers and actually do your writing. Um, everybody's working on their own projects. You're not necessarily collaborating on the projects. But just the idea of being in the same room with somebody else who's doing what I'm doing um, and I'm accountable. You know, it's how many people find it easy to blow off our own writing time? Oh, that refrigerator just needs to be cleared out um, or, or whatever it is that gets in the way. But if I've got an appointment with somebody, I'm going to keep that appointment. Um, another thing that I have found useful is writing practice groups. Um, and in the last couple of years, I've started teaching a workshop called Meditate Create. And people come together and we actually do a little meditation. We do some um, fevered writing together and then people write. And it's kind of an opportunity to just um, get yourself going, clear the crust off. Um, and then, of course, there are groups where you get feedback on your work, um, where you bring work and with a set of guidelines, and I have to emphasize how important those guidelines are, so that people um, have a constructive experience of getting feedback on their work, but it's a way to know how your work is landing. I may think I've done this, 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 and this, but if somebody reads it and doesn't get that, it's useful for me to know. Um, I think uh, putting together readings with other people, um, having a, you know, a group of people go out and do readings together, you know, it, it kind of gets you over the butterfly part of it, and it can also be kind of a nice marketing tool for yourselves, and you contextualize yourself with writers that, that you enjoy. So, uh, and, and of course, publishing together. Um, is another thing, and, and it may be a self-publishing effort, or it may be possible to approach a publisher um, with a concept that involves a group, um, or people kind of all addressing the same theme or the same process. So um, those are some of the things that I've been involved with, but they all really come out of that desire to um, share the creative experience not just with an audience, but with other creators as well. Thanks. Thank you, Tay. <laughs> I took, um, I was in uh, Terry's Tuesday night writing workshop for um, about two years, and I always say it was sort of my second MFA um, because, you know, probably like a lot of writers, when I emerged from school, I didn't necessarily think that I was done learning everything there was to learn and I needed some structure and um, Writers at Work is a really, really excellent resource for that. So I have to put in a little um, plug for that. But it also kind of leads to um, my next question, which is, you know, I, I know that as a um, student emerging into the world where I didn't have the structure of school um, felt kind of daunting to me, so um, I'm curious, and you guys can, you know, 
answer at random. We don't have to go down the line. Um, was there a time where you felt like um, you didn't have the community or resources you needed as a writer, and um, how did you address that? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I remember when I first started writing, um, and I identify myself as a poet. I don't know how many of you are poets uh, versus other kinds of writers, so pretty much everything I'm saying is, is oriented in that community. But I was writing some things, and I, I weren't sure, wasn't sure what, what I was doing, really. Is this poetry? Is this not poetry? And I found a listing in the LA Weekly for, uh, uh, this is 1990 maybe, for a place called the Iguana Cafe, which no longer exists, that uh, was doing a Sunday afternoon poetry circle, where you would show up and you'd read a poem, and then people would critique it, you know, sort of like a workshop, and then the next person would go, et cetera. And, it, and going to that space at that time was a very, I, I immediately found a niche of people. They were very encouraging right away. They told me what they liked about what I did. They told me what they thought could be better. And um, that group of people and that experience really informed um, what became my involvement in LA, po LA Poetry, which is been consistent ever since then. So I think, and this really I think uh, piggybacks on what you said, Terry, finding uh, a cadre of people, finding your niche is, is super important. You need to find other people who are doing what you're doing, who are struggling with the same things that you're struggling with, who are succeeding at the same things that you're trying to succeed at. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, I would assume that all of us would answer yes to that at some level, just because I think that we create spaces out of our own need. And, and then I can only speak for myself, like for sure, it was, it was not totally selfless. It was definitely like, oh, well, you know, there were a few of us trying to create art and do it in this city and not leave this city and, um, and love this city. Like I love LA. And I think we have a lot of hardships um, because we, we stereotype ourselves and we think that it's so hard to um, do things with community. Uh, I was recently at a, at a director's panel in, in Pasadena, at the Pasadena Playhouse, and you know most of the directors are not LA natives uh, of, of the larger uh, regional and Lort theaters here. And um, you know there, there were all kinds of sort of side comments on, on this city and LA, and one of the directors was sort, sort of saying, you know, well, uh, we stay in our cars and we kind of, you know, once in a while run into community. And I thought, you know, no. <laughs> there are so many people here that, that have community because one, they search for it, and two, they build it. And so uh, I, I, I'm so glad that Terry brought up all of those examples, such concrete ones about making time and space with each other. So two thoughts I had was, you know, um, uh, you know what, in workshop, I often tell the people that I'm working with, you know, we're not, we're not here just so that you can, the 15 of you, write as individuals. We're actually doing this on purpose in a community. You know, we're not just, we don't just happen to be like in this class because there are 15 people that needed this space and, and instead we'd rather do a one-on-one. -on -one. No, we're purposely, you know, in this community writing together. And I do think that that has a huge impact on all of us. And I, I, I think that um, as much as I marvel sometimes at retreats that take us out of our zone, out of our home zone and put us like in the woods or, you know, these cottages, they, they sound really cool. At the same time, I'm always searching for like the retreat that's gonna put me in the middle of the city for like a week, you know, like in the middle of downtown. And, uh, and, and, and that kind of experience, like to feed off of that energy and to feed off of, you know, each other. Let's make that retreat. You know what I'm saying? I, I really, really feel that. And I, I, yeah, so maybe poets and writers can make a new city retreat. We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> Uh, I'll say for me, I think um, I've been out of school for a while now. I'm older than I look, believe me. Um, I'm 107. Uh, I, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, I just like stopped writing. I couldn't write anymore, and I couldn't 
uh, do any, I couldn't find any reason to be writing. It just wasn't, uh, it wasn't a release, it wasn't an inspiration, it wasn't anything that I was interested in doing. And then that's when my life kind of like, you know in the movies when things are like really slow and that's like <laughs> what happened to me? And then I was like, this sucks. <laughs> so I quit my job. <laughs> Uh, the day after I decided to, uh, which was, you know, if you do that, have a little savings. Um, <laughs> but I was a little living on the edge. And then I uh, just kind of bounced around and just it was bouncing. And then I was pushed towards, um, towards 826 LA. And I came in as someone who used to write a lot and had basically, it was just like a blank page for years. And what I found was, um, in terms of community building and working with other writers, um, kind of making it not about me and my issues and why I was sort of stalled, uh, but showing and explaining to other people why it's a cool thing to do and how it can be really, really fun. Um, and seeing the first day that I was there as an intern, um, I will tell you the story very briefly. We uh, do a field trip where students come in in a class and we tell them that upstairs live Mr. and Mrs. Barnacle and their publishers. And we are the most prestigious publishing house in the United States. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Uh, unfortunate, and we won all of the pubbies. The pubby is also the most prestigious award you can win. I don't know if you guys know this. Um, and we haven't won it in about 150 years because we haven't uh, published any original stories. And, um, and then this voice came on over the PA system. And I was like, I had been there for exactly like 15 minutes. I was like, I don't know what is happening in this world. And then the voice fired um, the person who was leading the field trip for, for not being original. And uh, then they went in the back and forth begging for his job back. No, you know, you can get your job back if you write 10,000 original stories. And what, what we, then he would turn to the kids and be like, all right, um, so I've lost my job. And uh, this is really bad. And I need you to help me write a book to try and get my job back. And the kids uh, would be really into it because this, this creature that lived upstairs, in addition to firing this very friendly person who they'd been interacting with all morning, also the creature hated children. And so they were very upset. <laughs> and so um, we started writing and we would have, um, we have volunteers drawing illustrations for this book and the kids work as a class to write a storybook and they write their own ending for this book. And at the end of the field trip, they leave with their book published, um, printed, uh, just a little, we have a little binding machine upstairs and they get their photo on the back. Um, and it started, it was just this world about this magical octopus that these kids were writing as a class. And it was just so, uh, it kind of took me back to being that young and being like, I wish I had that when I was a kid because I was so into writing. And what happened? Like, why can't I just sit down and, and be okay with a world with a magical octopus and, and find the love of putting those words on the page for your own self and just to, to have fun with it. Um, and so seeing other people be inspired to write and learning what writing is um, has brought me back to my word processor. <laughs> <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> I guess the only thing that I want to add is that um, at those times that I feel in need of inspiration um, or community, it's been helpful to, to go to other art forms as, as well in addition to writing. That going out to see dance or listen to music or see some theater or go to a visual art exhibit can spark things uh, with my words that that maybe just looking at other words wouldn't have done. Um, and I feel really lucky that we're, you know, here in Los Angeles, we have such a wealth. Uh, there's always too many things to do on any given evening instead of, oh, there's nothing to do or just one thing to do. Um, and to that point, I just want to mention that two weeks from today, Saturday, January 25th, many of the museums throughout Los Angeles are free on that day. So put it on your calendar, go look at some art. Okay, hey, thank you, Terry. Um, one thing that's come up that um, inevitably comes up in conversations about Los Angeles is that it is um, geographically very fragmented. Um, and you know, when um, Jamie and I 
have um, led meetings of writers. Um, always, when we ask, you know, what are the needs of writers in Los Angeles, somebody will say, well, it would be great if there was like one website or newsletter where there was like this central clearinghouse where everything was listed, you know, every event that we could go to, every publication that we could submit to, every bookstore. And, you know, Poets and Writers is doing its best to be that clearinghouse. But um, I also kind of feel like, oh, you guys, it's, it's not going to get more centralized. Mm -hmm. Like, we're living in a very fragmented age, and LA is a very fragmented city. But I also don't think that that's necessarily such a negative thing, because mm -hmm. it allows for um, a lot of different voices and personalities to really develop. So I'm kind of curious what um, what you guys have witnessed in terms of the different little sub-scenes or even projects um, around Los Angeles that relate to literature. I, um, I don't know that I have like the answer to that question, but I have something that's probably really rude to say. Uh, so I'm sorry if I insult anyone, um, but uh, as someone who lives on the east side and works on the west side, and I commute back and forth, I've done it for eight years, um, living in Hollywood and working um, in Mar Vista, San Monaco, or Venice, um, I, every single day I meet people who refuse to drive past the 405, or they refuse to go out of Silver Lake, or they refuse this and this and this. Don't be that person. That's why it's <laughs> fragmented. Yes, we're a car culture and it sucks sometimes because my car is 14 years old and I get it. But, uh, you know, and we have buses. We have a subway system. We have an expo line that's slowly growing. And when you feel contained and sort of fractured and like you're in your own pocket of Los Angeles, that's on you and you need to get out and go to the other side of town and visit a local bookstore or go to another side of town where you're like, oh my God, I have to drive 40 minutes to go to this reading? Do it. Uh, because what you're going to find... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, most people get mad when I give this speech. Um, because what you're going to find when you do that is, yeah, you're going to go to that reading and you're going to hear some probably really good stuff and some other stuff, and then you're going to like leave as a, as a happier person, sure, but also what you're gonna find is you're gonna drive down the street and you're gonna be like, hey, that coffee house looks cool, I should go in there sometime. Oh, hey, I didn't know that there was a museum there. Oh, I didn't, hey, I recognize this person. And you're making Los Angeles this sprawling, wonderful city that I love so much, you're making it a community. Just because we're giant doesn't mean we can't be intimate. And I think if you just get out of what your comfort zone is, whatever streets you consider your comfort zone, um, explore this city. And there's so much here that is just under the surface because a central hub would take days. Like you could read it for days and days and not know everything that there is. So, so move, be mobile and explore. And that's my advice. <laughs> I wanted to talk about something that I did just last week. Um, my partner was invited to read with the Pond Water Society, which is uh, located in Covina. And you can look them up online. They've got a Facebook presence, Pond Water Society, and they've got a website. Um, and this is a, a poetry, a monthly poetry gathering that happens in, in the home of Joanna and Ed Baines, and they just decided to open up their home to poets and poetry. And I was kind of prepared, I have to confess, I was prepared to be a little snotty about it. Um, and, and I had to just totally eat all of those uh, stupid words that I originally had, because it was magnificent. They have a feature, um, they serve wine and cheese, the feature person reads, then they serve dinner to everybody who comes, and then there's an open reading. And people are wildly respectful of the work, and the work was of good quality, and it was just a great thing to find in Covina. So, um, and I think there are lots of different pockets. I don't know how many people here have been to the world stage in Lemert Park. They have this wonderful weekly workshop 
again, people just show up, they bring their work, they get up, they read it, and then people talk about it. And they've got some folks who are very knowledgeable who are kind of like the backbone, Michael Datcher and Peter Harris and some other folks who are always there. And they kind of provide that grounding, but everybody has a voice and has a say. Um, and I, I, I want to echo Lauren's comment about, you know, leave your neighborhood because, I mean, stay in your neighborhood, but also <laughs> leave your neighborhood and, and find out what's going on in different pockets of the city because it's amazing. I agree. I think that I, one of the best things to inspire your own writing is to get out of your element, you know, because then your eyes are wide open to all the things that are different about what it is that you're seeing. And it doesn't mean you have to travel to Europe. You could go to Covina, mm -hmm. you know, um, <laughs> and any event where they serve food is, uh, you know, <laughs> is, is when was the last time any of you had a meal? I mean, we're writers, for God's sakes. It just doesn't happen. Um, there, there are a couple of places where th there isn't, I don't think, a, a comprehensive uh, a solution that exists or that necessarily will ever exist, um, as Cheryl suggested. Um, but there are a couple of places where it converges a little bit. For example, um, if this is your first time here at Beyond Baroque, uh, don't let it be your last. Um, there's nothing like Beyond Baroque almost anywhere. I mean, this is a dedicated literary institution with a facility, a performance space, and a bookstore. There's a free workshop here every Wednesday. There's an, a free open mic every, uh, every Sunday that you can come and participate in. And there's, there's such a rich and diverse program of things that happen here. Um, when you come here on any given day for any given program, uh, you might be with a completely different set of people. It's really, it's, it's a hub where things kind of converge. Um, in, the, in the vein of a place where you can go and look up what's going on, there is a website called poetics.net, P-O-E-T-I-X dot net, um, which <laughs> exists to service Southern California's uh, poetry community. And they, uh, it's updated every month, and there are listings of readings happening everywhere between San Diego and Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm always surprised when I'm at a reading um, and there's someone there who's never been to a reading before and they say something like, oh, I, I had no idea this kind of thing even happened in LA. Um, and if you look at the calendar at poetics.net, you'll see that there are four or five things happening every single day somewhere in Southern California that you can participate in. Um, it's a great, great resource. Um, uh, uh, Poets and Writers runs a uh, a listserv, uh, it's a, a Yahoo group, I think, um, called SoCal, SoCal Lit List, um, that uh, every day has all kinds of things being posted to it that you can receive in your email box, as well as post to as well. There's tons of resources like that available. I mean, the simplest search online, and, and you'll, you'll come up with all kinds of email lists and Facebook groups that you could join, um, where information will just start streaming to you uh, far more than you can, uh, uh, frequently than you can process. And poetryflash.org is another uh, good one for listing readings and open mics. Mm. Something we're going to try to do on tuesdaynightproject.org is also identify and like map and calendar the multidisciplinary venues as well. So that, uh, because a lot of times those are not listed on poetry only readings, but you know, they definitely feature all kinds of artists. And um, I also choose not to ever use the word fragmented. I think we're geographically awesome. I think we're geographically sprawling. I think we're geographically mesmerizing. I'm born and raised in LA, and I'm always still finding something mm -hmm. new. You know, I haven't been to a lot of the readings that were even brought up already on this table. And um, so I, I think it's, it's endless, you know, what can happen here. I think that, I, I mean, I love New York, I love San Francisco, but seven by seven, seven by 13, here we're 49 by 49, you know? In terms of miles, square miles, right? That's crazy. <laughs> and the other thing too is that for me, I, as a writer, driving has been a part of my process. Mm -hmm. It's not that I am always mad in my car and I'm always in traffic. You know, take Washington. Take Washington Boulevard if you're going from here to downtown LA at three o'clock in the afternoon. Trust me, try it. It's totally different. Don't take the 10. Don't, you know what I mean? Don't take the freeways all the time. Take the alleys, take the side streets, take the surface streets. And, um, 
That's so L.A. That's so L.A. what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, you know, true, though. Yeah, but it's true. So, yeah, I just, yeah, I think that we have an exciting expanse. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so m many of you, most of you, have um, actually started your own reading series or literary organizations or websites. And um, so I'm curious just what advice you guys would have for other people who might want to do the same. Survey, for sure. I think survey the neighborhood that you're, you're in. Um, and do, if, I feel like if we want to build community, we have to do it with community. So even though we're highly capable individuals, there's nothing like doing it with a team. Um, I would definitely say those things. Mm -hmm. be, be encouraging to whoever wants to participate. I mean, don't, don't start your own thing to spite other things, you know? Um, uh, it's, 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 it's my mission, this mission of the Poetry Superhighway, to expose as many people to as many other people's poetry as possible. And I read a lot of stuff, and I see a lot of stuff at readings that um, isn't necessarily my thing, but it's really good at what it is, you know? And um, to, just to be open to whoever wants to participate in, in your thing, in the spirit of uh, you know, knowing that when you see stuff that you don't like, as well as when you see stuff that you do like, it will inform your own voice, you know, for better or for worse. Uh, well, usually for better, really. Um, uh, and, and teaching that to the people who choose to participate in what you do is, is a great thing. A lot of people go to open readings um, let me put it this way, a lot of people will refuse to go to an event if there isn't an open reading. Um, don't be that person and do what you can in your space to foster a culture where people go to expose themselves to what is happening there, um, as well as have the opportunity to sharing their own work. Well, I'll say, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I put on a couple times a year a reading for our volunteers to share with other volunteers what they have to what they have written themselves um, because we get a lot of writers as volunteers um, and it's really fun to write about magical octopi every day but then sometimes you want to share your own work a little bit so we put on something called indoor voices where uh, volunteers get to read to other volunteers and my advice as someone who puts these on uh, in the middle of doing everything else is just be flexible um, you know, sometimes things aren't going to line up the way that you thought they would, and maybe what you're hearing isn't what you anticipated hearing, um, but, you know, as long as it's uh, a loving space, you know, it's, it's for the betterment of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I'm going to say that my, my advice would be to align what you're doing with your own purpose as a writer, with your own needs as a writer. Um, it's, it's possible to do that. I don't think it has to be in conflict. But um, I think if it's too selfless, uh, it might be a great thing for other people, but I think it fosters burnout. Um, and I think the best, the best things that I've seen go on in communities are where the needs of the organizer are being met at the same time as the needs of the participants. Um, well, speaking of community, I want to open it up to questions from all of you guys. Do our microphones around here still? What drew you to 826 LA? Um, to be, so for a little backstory, this organization was founded by Dave Eggers, and a lot of people um, find out about us because um, they really love his work or they really love McSweeney's work, and I had never read any of those things. So I came into it really uh, virginal in a way. Um, and what drew me to it was um, just. Uh, this sounds so cheesy, especially because I like bring and find volunteers. But it was the magic of it. And um, transforming a room of reluctant kids into published authors um, is what 
sucked me in in those first 15 minutes and has continued to push me for four years, where every day, even if I'm like, ah, I have so much I have to do, like this is just the most stressful day ever, when I hear a kid ringing the cowbell because they finished their story and the whole entire room erupts into applause, it's that. It's finding what I found naturally as a kid and bringing it to kids who most likely wouldn't come across that in their lives. And that's what continues to push me towards it. Yes. What do you all think about uh, book clubs? Do you belong to any? Have you belonged to any? What type are they? And how do you find a good one? Well, I could answer that. <laughs> um, I think in 2008, I made it my New Year's resolution to start a book club because I'd been in another book club that, that I um, liked, but it kind of... Um, it just sort of dwindled into non-existence, which is, a, in my experience, is a challenge of both um, writing groups and book clubs. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started one with some of the same people and some new people. And um, so, and we've been going ever since then. So it's I think that's a pretty successful book club. And um, our, our methods are very simple. Um, which is, we always, like, all I do is maintain the, the email that goes out. Like, I don't, other, beyond that, I'm not the leader of the book club. Um, at the end of every book club, we choose the book for the next book club, and we choose the date. So we don't have the option of it just sort of disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, and it also means that the people who show up kind of get a little bit more say and when and what will be coming up next. Um, you don't have to read the book to attend. And we always have food and a, a theme for the food. It's like potluck. Um, so, you know, we, um, right now we're reading this kind of unusual work of speculative fiction called uh, 1,000 White Women. It's about um, 1,000 white women going to, um, the plains in the 1800s and um, marrying um, Native Americans in the Cheyenne tribe and um, asking like, what would that be like? And so in our sort of like uh, jokey NPC theme was, um, all right, Thanksgiving dinner, you guys. This is our, <laughs> this is our theme. So, and sometimes our, our themes will be very loose. We read a book about superheroes and we're like, our, our food theme is gonna be super foods. Uh, just foods that you think are super. <laughs> so, um, I and, and the reason that it, that I've enjoyed it is partly because you know, I love that I interact with so many writers on a regular basis. But um, I think all of us as writers have to be really invested in readers. Um, you know, hopefully we want to reach beyond people who are just um, uh, other writers. Um, but who still really care deeply about books. And, you know, I'm always, I always want to know what just other people that I find interesting and smart are interested in reading and what they think of what they read. So um, I think it's, I think it's, I like book clubs. Um, I, you know, I'm always a little cranky when books have like, um, you know, the book club guide the in the back questions. because it just feels, it feels so um, forced and I'll get, I'll get sort of, like, I think the book that we're reading now is like a big book club book. It, I found a copy of it in a section of Target called like book club books <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, you guys, like we didn't, why did we do that? Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's not my choice. That's, that's the whole thing. It's like we vote, and um, it's good for me to get out of my reading comfort zones, too, and my own snobbery. Oh, sorry. My question is, in doing events, have you developed um, not just guidelines, but tricks of the trade of hosting and facilitating, <coughs> excuse me, that um, yield a result or interaction or effect that you particularly like? Well, I'll, I'll speak to um, one of the guidelines that I use in workshops now, most of my workshops, 
<clears throat> and, and that is that I no longer um, let people say what they liked, what they don't like, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and the reason for that is we all have our own tastes. And if all we're doing is kind of reinforcing our own tastes, we're not helping the writer and we're not really growing um, as writers ourselves, I think. So I will ask people to talk about, when we read a piece of work, to talk about what meaning did you get from it. It can be very useful for a writer to see how, what did people learn from this, you know, if anything. And was that what I wanted them to learn or was that a whole bunch of other stuff that I didn't even know I was saying? Um, I'll ask people to talk about what they noticed in a piece of work. And that might be something that's, um, you know, formal or might be about the content. But noticing is this much more neutral thing. And then I invite people to ask questions about the work. Um, and the questions might be form, content, or what if. And what if is as close to prescriptive as I like people to get. Because it's, it can be really different if, if I'm writing something. If somebody says to me, well, why did you start that here? Or why didn't you start that three pages in? Then I can ask myself that question, well, why did I start it here? And well, you know, what would happen if I, you know, cut off those first three pages? What would I gain? What would I lose? But the decision ultimately stays with me. If I'm in a workshop and somebody says, get rid of those first three pages, even if they say it in a nice way, I, those first three pages, you don't need them. Suddenly that agency is taken away from me. Um, and I started to see writers in workshops writing to the feedback and kind of losing touch with what they started out to do. So that's, those are some guidelines that I um, utilize these days. I, having run an open mic for a long time, I've put a lot of thought into this. I think that whatever guidelines you do establish, they should apply to everyone um, equally. I think, that, you know, this seven minute time limit, I firmly believe when someone's at the mic, there's at least one person in the audience who wishes they would have stopped much earlier, and there's at least one person who wishes they could go on longer. So being, you know, consistent with those guidelines is just fair to, to everyone. Um, also, uh, I, I think uh, whether you're the organizer or also the host, I think you need someone facilitating it who can do so in a smooth manner, who's sort of conscious of what's happening and what the needs of the audience are. You know, someone at their turn at the open mic reads something, you know, intense or heavy or, God forbid, bad. You know, what, what are you going to say when you get up there to help transition to the next thing, you know, using humor is a great way to do that. Um, um, or at least acknowledging what, is, what has just happened. I can't tell you how many times I've been at an open mic and someone has just done something um, great or whatever and then the person gets up and there, there isn't a, you know, thank you so much, that, you know, whatever, it's some kind of acknowledgement that something actually just happened, you know. Um, it helps transition to the next thing and helps the people who are participating you know, feel like they've just done something legitimate, you know? I think also, um, piggybacking off of that, uh, we just try to be really communicative and really transparent about everything. Like, every little thing in our venue has, it, it has a deliberate decision. So, um, I always think in sustaining a venue that I think most actually about the crew. You know, I think in curating something, I think about the experience for the artist and for the, the audience, but in sustaining the venue, I think about the crew. And, and what I mean by that is, I wanna respect their time. What we do, where I'm sure most of us, or all of us do, it's a volunteer, grassroots, you know, venture. And we pay small stipends to our sound engineer and things like that, but it's bare bones. So I wanna assure everybody that we're gonna get out by 10 o'clock. <laughs> You know, and also we want people to come back. So we want it to be consistent. Like if it just goes on and on forever and ever and we never stop anybody or we don't have a timekeeper, we just try to run a really tight ship. Um, and it's really out of respect to everybody in respect to their time. So we just try to be super consistent about that. 
So both, both to kind of address the issue of community and in honor of uh, Lauren's dedication and her enthusiasm about 826, there's another uh, outfit out there that I've been volunteering with for the past five years that I just wanted to mention, which is called Right Girl, mm -hmm. W-R-I-T-E Girl. Uh, and it is only for girls, it's for high school age girls. Um, the wonderful thing is, again, as Lauren says, you know, you're with a community of writers who are looking to give back to at-risk girls. And also, because we put on monthly workshops that bring in different genres of writers, I have met so many wonderful writers that I wouldn't have otherwise. And working on the workshop team, I've learned how to facilitate a workshop. I've learned how to plan a workshop. I've learned so not only are you giving back, but you get so much. And so just anybody who's looking to volunteer and have that kind of sense of community, Right Girl is something to look into. Thank you for bringing up Right Girl. I, I actually mentored with them for um, two seasons, and it w was a great experience for me as a writer, and, and I hope for the, the girls that I mentored. I'm, I'm Facebook friends with one of them now, and I think she's in her mid-20s, which makes me feel old. But um, <laughs> But you know she's amazing. She's traveled the world and done a lot of things. So it's it's lots of fun. Another question um, in the stripe. Can you talk more about the poetry superhighway and can anyone submit to it? I guess that one's for me. <laughs> um, yes, uh, um, anyone can submit to it. Um, we, as I mentioned, publish two poets online every week, uh, chosen from email submissions. Um, you could submit as often as you like during the year, but if published during the calendar year, then you can't submit again till the following calendar year. Um, uh, I'm open to, there are no content or style restrictions, um, though I suppose if you read through it, you, you might see, you know, you can, it's really good advice if you're submitting anywhere to read a publication before you submit to it. They may say they're open to any particular style, but then you'll read it and see, oh, well, they don't really publish, you know, obtuse Irish limericks, so maybe I shouldn't, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, there, there are links to thousands of other writers' websites, individual writers' websites. Um, I publish a newsletter every week that gets emailed out that includes the newest links uh, sometimes that's places you could submit poetry to. Sometimes it's individual uh, writers' websites. Uh, there's a poetry classifieds section, uh, which uh, which you can advertise in if you wanted to, uh, but also is a good place to look for calls for submission and uh, uh, news about books coming out and contests and that kind of thing. Um, um, what else would you like to know? Mm -hmm. um, this is about writing as performing, because in the past it seemed like a number of years ago people could just get up and read from their work. But um, I know, Terry, you've changed that a lot. I've heard really good things about your performances. You have music and art and all kinds of things, and dance and whatever. Um, I've heard from people who have attended. Um, but I want to know how you see um, the performance of the written word changing in the next couple of years in, in the venues that you do, any of you? Does that make sense? Okay. I don't know that it's actually changing, but I can tell you that um, as a writer, one of the best things you can do is get up in front of people and read your work um, because you'll hear it yourself in a way that you haven't heard it before. Um, you might discover that the way that you put a particular line break in doesn't make sense when you're trying to actually read it out loud, and that might cause an edit. Um, you'll, you'll hear the way people react to your work, um, which you can't do if you're sitting in a room by yourself. You know, and, uh, oh, they didn't laugh at that point, or, oh, they, they gave that, you know, oh, you know, that must have been a, an important line that I read there. So I, I don't know that it's really... Changing, maybe maybe I'm I'm wrong, but uh, but it's certainly an important thing that to do to go out and do. Well, and Tracy, you have a multidisciplinary series, so it seems like you're interested in how those things play off of each other. Yeah, I think um, I don't. Yeah, I I don't know how much poetry as performance is going to change in the next two years. I, I think that 
you know, with spoken word as a form, right? And it's a very big, wide open form. I think that there, there's always been an element of performance in writing. Um, and I, when, at our venue, when I see different kinds of writers come in, you know, we have everything from the person who's just buried their nose, you know, into their paper and they're just trying to get it out, you know, to the people who are running over uh, all around the stage and like hugging the columns and doing mm -hmm. all of that. So I think for me as both, or as, as, as a curator, an artist, and an audience member watching that, I'm just always looking for what is their need in saying this thing right now, no matter what, it, no matter what way in which they're doing it. What, what is their need? What is their honest sort of voice that they're, that they're kind of like opening up, you know, to? And, and so that, that has never changed in terms of seeing people who, whether they're running around the courtyard hugging columns or if they're, you know, reading for the first time, the quality uh, can come through because they're being really honest, you know what I mean? And so I think that we've gotten to see, and I, I see this in other venues as well, where it doesn't really matter who's professional, who's been on Deaf Poetry Jam, or who's doing it for the first time. I, I think that our audience just naturally gravitates towards folks who are just open and honest. You know, so I'm not sure if that answers your questions. I think, I think poetry and, and performance kind of go together just by the mere fact that we want to read these things out loud. I just sort of ask, if, is there more pressure on writers to be performers as opposed oh. to writers? Oh, I, I do think that different venues kind of dictate that, that culture. So that some venues for sure, like you go in there, you're like, oh man, I don't think I can read here. I, I'm not a slam poet, you know? Um, and then other venues that are just more like really not a lot of rules. You just kind of go, you have your time limit. So I do think it, it does depend on the venue. But I also think that it's a good challenge to read in whatever venue you are in just to kind of test yourself against those things, you know? Um, so I think it's different everywhere, actually. I think it does change from venue to venue, right? Yeah. I don't know. I think we probably have time for just one more question, if anyone has one. Charles. Hi. Um, I love everything that you're saying around building community and the generosity of that. But I'm, I'm struck by Terry's comment that the the needs of the organizer align with the needs of the project. And then, so I'm curious how, in all that you're doing for your community projects, where, when and where and how do you find your writing time and your dedication to yourself? Because you're all very committed and generous in, in helping the community and you feed off of that, I understand. But I'm just curious, what you, how, when do you get to write? I'll start that one off. Um, you know, first of all, it's very inspiring to me to be around other people's creativity and to be with other artists. So that's always been um, a, a, a nourishing thing for me to do. Um, a few years ago, I, I had gotten Writers at Work was, was only offering feedback groups. And I started to feel, mm, I don't know, where, how, am I, how am I getting fed by this? And so I started this Meditate Create workshop, which is actual writing practice, and I write along with other people. And you know, I kind of stopped and asked myself, or actually a friend of mine said, well, what do you need? If you're thinking you want to do something else with writers at work, what do you need? And I thought, oh, well, and, and that was the answer I came up with. And you know, because it's my space, uh, my studio, I can, I can ask myself, what do I need, and figure out, and then, you know, find out who else needs that also. I, I think for your own work, you, you know, it doesn't work for everyone to, to find a dedicated time to write, and maybe it does, and if you have the ability in your life to do that, by all means, do it. I, I think as I mentioned earlier, removing yourself from your normal everyday element is a great way to inspire writing. And if you don't have the time to write when you're in that new element, 
um, but you come up with an idea, at least write down the idea or make a note in your phone or whatever it is so you can at least go back and write that one thing because uh, there's the seed of an idea. Um, most, of, most of my books are written while traveling. I probably write a handful of poems during the year, but then during the week that I'm on vacation with my wife in Baltimore or Richmond, Virginia or London or whatever, you know, an entire book comes out of that because my, my stuff is really observational, etc. to the point where actually there's a poem in the book that's just a quote from my wife that's, you know, give me the pen, please, you know. So, um, but uh, it, you, you just need to, you know, find your, find your own way, you know, and if it's a dedicated writing time, then be consistent and true to that. But, it, but if it's not, and that idea comes, at least make a note so you can make a point of coming back to it later. Yeah, I think I am the exact same way, and maybe even like to a really much greater extent where it's like, I'm a very scatterbrained person and I'll jump through meetings with like four people at the same time. And then, uh, and then you know those people that, where it's like, here's how to get fit, do squats when you're waiting in line. And it's like, okay, but, or I could just be writing things down. And so if I am like the notes app in my phone is just like nonsense. Um, but to me, it means a lot. And when my phone crashes and I lose it, it is so frustrating. But it's like, I write uh, when I'm waiting and when I'll, if I can't sleep and I wake up and I have a good idea or I really am inspired, then, you know, all right, I'll be really tired tomorrow, but I'm going to do it right now at three o'clock in the morning or um, to... <laughs> My boyfriend, who shares a car with me, uh, ha severe hatred of this, is I'll write on little slips of paper so that it looks like garbage in my car, but there's important, <laughs> there's important notes on that receipt from Burger King that if you throw it away, I'm going to be really mad. And, you know, like someday if I clean all of that out and put it together, I'm sure that there's something really great in all of that. But for me, it is just like putting it in, putting those squats in. Whenever I get a chance of just uh, being inspired, being in the moment, even if I am driving, I'll be safe about it. <laughs> I totally feel you. I, I, I have like a little secret group of friends where we share sometimes the poems we just write in our cars. Yeah. While, while, while being very safe about yes. it. Pulled over to the side <laughs> of the road. Mostly. I've gotten good at, you know, writing on my right leg. Um, or on the air You know, like on a little seat on my right leg, you know. But, you know, I'm safe. I really am. And, but it's like, yeah, it's, it, everybody, like, so many people do that. So I just want to put a whole chat book together just of that. Um, I love Google Docs because I can access that through my phone so I can write wherever and I can access that on other people's computers and things like that. Um, I love time management, you know. I think that that's been huge for my process to really like have smaller chunks of time in a certain amount of time and be consistent about that. And and um, and I stay often and I leave often, very much so. And I think a lot about place. And so sometimes it's pronounced to write about place and home and community and things like that when not here. Um, and, um, and I guess one last thought I had with that was, well, I can't remember now, so it wasn't You'll important. remember in your car, yeah, and then you just write, write it down, down in the car. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll text you. <laughs> Voice recognition also is really helpful, too. Yeah. You know, so, like, if you're driving and, you know, you mm -hmm. don't want to be, you know, writing or, or, or trying to type it, you know, I, I, I think that that's been really, really great, too, and the technology is so much better. You can really do that. I just love that um, my New York coworkers are hearing this, that they got to come to LA and, and hear a panel about writing poems on Burger King receipts <laughs> while you're driving. <laughs> New York doesn't have it all, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, let's, let's go caffeinate. Yeah.